Seattle-based author Timothy Egan has written 10 books. His newest is called A Fever in the Heartland and is described on the cover as the Ku Klux Klan's plot to take over America and the woman who stopped them. The publisher Viking says of Mr. Egan's book, The Roaring Twenties, The Jazz Age, have been characterized as a time of Gatsby frivolity. But it was also the height of a uniquely American hate group, the Ku Klux Klan. They hated blacks, Jews, and Catholics, and immigrants in equal measure, and took radical steps to keep these people from the American promise. Timothy Egan, in your acknowledgments, I just want to read the first couple of lines. You say, time traveling, the great passion of historians can be restorative on those dark days of our present. But spending the past three years in the America of the 1920s was anything but therapeutic for this author. What are you talking about? Well, it was a really hard time. Uh, you know, we, uh, I wrote a book about the Dust Bowl and the, in that story, Steinbeck defined what happened as a bunch of Okies leaving a central part of the United States, the High Plains, to go into California. But the story I found was that two thirds of the people didn't go anywhere. In the case of the 1920s, F. Scott Fitzgerald got out and defined it. I don't think he did it intentionally. It just became the book of the era. It wasn't really that popular at the time with The Great Gatsby as this exuberant, the roaring 20s, jazz, prohibition, flappers. Um, the stocks were all higher. The buildings were all bigger. All of that certainly was going on. But the three years that I'm speaking of there, Brian, was a very dark period that this uniquely American terror group, this persistent hate group, the Ku Klux Klan, which had disappeared in 18, by 1872, reappeared in the 1920s and, and just took off. It was the peak of its power. So that's what I'm referring to was really how dark it still was, but how mainstream it was. They had six million members, upwards of six million members. And remember, when you're a member of the Klan in the 1920s, you put your hand on a Bible. And you swore an oath to, quote, forever uphold white supremacy. And so I saw, you know, a lot of these, you know, quintessential Americans in the quintessential American state saying some pretty awful things and doing some pretty awful things. So it was very discouraging. Of course, you're talking about Indiana, Noblesville, Irvington, Indianapolis, Marion County, Muncie, all those towns. Did you go there? To write I went to everyone. I went to every one of those places you just named. I spent a lot of time in Indiana, <clears throat> starting in Evansville, uh, just across the Ohio River from Kentucky, where the Klan got its foothold of what would become an empire of the Ku Klux Klan of the North in the 1920s. It got its foothold. It started the first of the big Klan realms of the North in Evansville. Um, when I research a book, I like to do a lot of research by walking around. I mean, I read all the stuff. I read what's what historians have said about it. I go to the primary material, which is well preserved in Indiana, in the archives at Ball State, at Indiana University, Purdue, the Indiana Historical Society. It's all there. I mean, you cannot open a newspaper from the 1920s without seeing a huge block screaming headline about the Ku Klux Klan's hold on this uniquely American state. So I, you know, I, I wanted to know what it was like in Noblesville, which is a terrific town. Where the trial happened it's the sets the stage for the centerpiece of my story i wanted to know what it was like in evansville and why that you know what the what the air felt like what the what it was like to walk along the river what it was like to be there at night um you know i look for these sort of granular details that i can put into a story so yeah i went everywhere in indiana describe david c stevenson as a man as a person right so he's at the center of this book and he is the grand dragon of the largest realm of the Ku Klux Klan the world had ever seen. At the peak of his power, one in three Hoosiers, one in three, excuse me, white native born men in Indiana joined the Ku Klux Klan. No state ever had so much saturation. There's 92 counties in your home state. 90 of them had a Klan chapter. So he, in four short years, went from a grifter, a con man, a person who had left one life 
one wife and child completely behind in Oklahoma, never even divorced her, just got up and left and badly beat another wife. And it was basically kicked out of his National Guard unit because he couldn't get along with the other men. A traveling salesman. He lands in Evansville, Indiana in 1921, and he discovers something that will finally make him rich. And what is it? It's the Ku Klux Klan. So in four short years, he goes from this grifter who rolls into town to being the most powerful realm, excuse, most powerful head of the largest realm of the Klan the world has ever seen. And he rises so far that his aspirations, not unreasonably, include the presidency. But describe him personally. What did he look like and what did he yeah. act like? He was a short, pudgy man. Uh, when I talk about him, he's in his mid-30s. He liked to be called the, the old man because it made him sound sort of avuncular. Um, he modeled himself after Napoleon. And he also had Mussolini as a role model. Though the clan of the 20s hated Italians because so many Sicilians were coming to this country, he did admire Mussolini. And he studied his speeches and made him a role model. He understood what people were afraid of. And he played to those fears. He understood what made people feel good. And he played to those feelings. He understood that there was a lot of churn going on in the 20s and a lot of fear of others. And if he could play to that, it would make him rich. He was a con man, yes. He was a grifter, yes. But he was also a brilliant manipulator of human emotions. And... Um, that's why he succeeded. Who did the Klan hate? So in the original Klan, the one most people know about, the 1860s and 1872, was born almost entirely in reaction to a single and startling fact. Just after the Civil War, 4 million people, 36% of the American South, went from human property to American citizens. That Klan was formed as a reaction backlash to that. They could not have all these African Americans as citizens in their midst. And it was a terror group. Night riding, raping, pillaging, murder, burning of barns and stores, attacking white women who came south to teach blacks in schools. And it was crushed by General Grant. The second Klan, which was formed in the 1920s, was the largest and biggest and greatest. And it was formed almost exactly 50 years later. And they hated, to answer your question, a whole new range of people. The original Klan hated Blacks. This Klan hated Catholics because Catholics were primarily immigrant. That is Italians, Irish, some Greeks. They hated immigrants and they hated Jews because we had our largest surge in immigration of Jews to our country at any time. These were people fleeing pogroms in places like now Ukraine. That's where my wife's family is from. Eastern Poland, uh, parts of Russia. Two million Jews came to this country in the first 15 years of the 20th century. The Klan hated them, thought they could never be real Americans. Also, black migration, the great migration, blacks are moving north. Cities that had never had a significant black population before suddenly had black population. And finally, to add it to that list of blacks, immigrants, Jews, and Catholics, they were very much afraid of, or at least appalled by, socially liberated women, so-called flappers. Now, my grandmother was a flapper, and she used to tell us stories of, uh, oh, my God's sake, Tim, I, of drinking bathtub gin and dancing all night to jazz out at the speakeasy at the edge of town in Seattle, Washington. And the Klan thought this was a real violation of the sort of hearth and home image of womanhood. So they would frequently break up these speakeasies, stage raids with their you know, morality patrols. So there was, just to summarize, four major types of merging Americans that they, just, that they hated. I'm going to jump right into the middle of probably the nub of your book. <clears throat> and I'm going to read from the dying letter and let you explain it in a second. But just this couple of sentences. He chewed me all over my body bit my neck and face, chewing my tongue, chewed my breast until they bled, my back, my legs, my ankles, and mutilated me all over my body. What's that from, and who is that woman? That is Madge Oberholzer, the 28-year-old single woman 
seemingly without power, who brings down the Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s. She's sort of an accidental heroine. She didn't set out to bring down the Klan. Many organizations did. The NAACP, the University of Notre Dame, whose students rioted against them when they staged a rally in South Bend. Um, so a, a group called um, Tolerance, which was Irish Americans, African Americans, Jews, having a newspaper that exposed them. They all failed. The person who ultimately succeeded, again, was a victim of D.C. Stevens, and that being Madge Oberholzer. Now, the statement that you read is the crux of the story, and I don't want to spoil the story, <laughs> but Stevenson, as he became more powerful, at one point he says, I am the law in Indiana, and he pretty much was the law. He ruled the state, became ever more personally monstrous. He not only was a man who advocated temperance as a raging alcoholic, who advocated prohibition as a bootlegger, who advocated uh, truth and, and honesty as a person who told 12 lies before he got out of bed in the morning, but he was a sexual predator. He attacked and raped several women. He beat many women, including several of his ex-wives who he just ditched, but he met his match when he attacked Madge Oberholzer. And what she's describing there was his increased monstrousness. He became, there's no other way to describe this, basically cannibalistic. He not only sexually attacked women and match, but he chewed them. And she, her lawyers made the point that the, well, that the, I don't want to spoil the story again, but that his attacks were so savage that they did something, you know, that turned the trial. Let, let's go back <clears throat> in the beginning. How did you discover Madge Oberholzer? Holzer. So, you know, I'm a native of the Pacific Northwest, and my last book was a was a spiritual journey, a pilgrimage I took through Europe. I followed a 1,200 mile long Via Francigena trail to Rome from Canterbury. It was brilliant. I mean, it was exhilarating. I found brilliant people along the way, but I wanted to do something closer to home. So I was going to go to Oregon, one state to my south, and write about the Klan in Oregon. I always knew that, you know, this supposedly woke state had a dark past from 100 years ago. They had a Klan um, governor, Walter M. Pierce. They were the only state in the United States to pass by popular vote, a measure that essentially outlawed Catholic schools. But then the story took me to Indiana. And a good journalist, a good storyteller, a good historian follows the story. I get to Indiana and I go, holy cow, this is unbelievable. As they called it in the 20s, it wasn't a secret. It was a Klan republic. The nickname for Indianapolis, largest city in the state, was Klanopolis. And so it's just astonishing and tough to get your head around the fact that one in three white males belonged to the Klan there. So it wasn't just that there was a totally Klan-controlled republic, but that incredibly awful man, but brilliant, controlled the state. And that so many seemingly nice people, you know, Rockwellian bankers, teachers, politicians, judges, preachers, merchants, all put their hand on that Bible and took that oath. It, it was just that these seemingly nice, normal, Main Street Americans were led by this monstrous man. So that that was the story. And, I, you know, you just can't resist it because it has a clash of, of titanic proportions. Is there anything new that you found in your story that hasn't been written years and years ago? Yeah, there was. Um, most of the histories of the Indiana Klan and the Klan of the 20s in general, aside from things like the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, when 300 blacks were brutally murdered in the heat of a Tulsa afternoon, something that people were never brought to justice and the Klan labor said was one of the best recruiting things that ever happened, and also the lynchings. Aside from those, the conventional wisdom on the 1920s Klan was that it was a Mayberry Klan you know, a bunch of chuckleheads, you know, yeah, it was a born out of the fraternal societies that were so big. And, you know, if you were, didn't belong to the Elks or Oddfellows or Redmen or one of these fraternal groups in the twenties, you basically didn't belong. Everyone belonged to a fraternal group. The largest fraternal group was the Ku Klux Klan. And that conventional wisdom has been that it was largely harmless. Yeah. They staged big parades. Yeah. They had a children's brigade called the Ku Klux Kitties children outfitted in clan robes in parades yeah they had a woman's auxiliary 
up to 2 billion women, many of them suffragettes, by the way, uh, who joined the Klan. And yeah, they had mayors and even governors, but they were largely nonviolent. Well, what I found was that's nonsense, that uh, there was a small town in Indiana. I, New York Times wrote about this. They didn't write it as a big story, but you can look at my source notes, where they basically ran, not basically, where they ran all the blacks out of this little town, out of town on three hours notice. The last known lynching of an African-American in the northern part of the United States was in Indiana. And there were several ex-Klansmen who were active in that lynching, and no one was ever brought to justice, even though hundreds of people posed in pictures standing next to those dangling corpses in Marion, Indiana. They firebombed the homes of priests and convents. They burned crosses of intimidation on the lawns of black families and on um, in front of police stations. They, you know, so they were not harmless. They were violent. They were what the Klan has always been at its core. It's a terror group. It's our oldest domestic terror group. So surface level Americana, I mean, the Klan had baseball games. There was a Klan team with the KKK stitched across their flannel. Oompa bands at the rallies. Lemonade stands where the Ku Klux Kitties would sell lemonade. Barbershop quartets. All the surface appearances of the Klan, but beneath it, terror was still part of it. So that's what I found was that, you know, they still practice quite a bit of awful violence. The trial was in 1925. And you said something that I don't often hear, but I'm surprised I don't often hear it. When you say, I don't want to give away the story. Authors have been coming on these programs we've had here for years. And how do you, how do you deal with that? This is a side issue because well, you're I trying to sell a book. Of course. And I wrote this book deliberately as a historical thriller. The last third of the book is a trial. And it's true. The entire story is true. And it's I have you know 30 pages of source notes because it's an unbelievable story. So I really wanted to show people, load up the source notes so people understand how, how this actually did happen. I wanted to write it in a granule level so you see step by step how this seemingly nice, wonderful state gave itself over to this awful group. But um, the way I get around the, telling what happened in the trials, I simply say they finally were in a court of law. And in a court of law, you can't demagogue the way you can in what a massive Klan rally. It's sworn testimony. And so the facts, the facts of what these people were all about finally came to fruition. And that's what led to the collapse of the Klan, by the way. And in this court of law, the most powerful words were those you read, Brian, the words of Madge Oberholzer. I have to just say this about this time. I've been sitting in for the last three months on the Oath Keepers trial and the Proud Boys trial. And as I read your book, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this sounds the same. The same base, the hate, the, the you know all the stuff that you point out here. And I wondered if you had any of these feelings as you were writing this book during this period? Oh, my God. I had so many holy cow moments. You know, and that's what's discouraging. I, I'll tell you what's encouraging and what's discouraging. Today, these Proud Boys are largely disdained. They're not hugely popular. And if you or I went to a microphone and called a press conference, or any politician for that matter, and announced that they were a member of the Ku Klux Klan, you or I would be hooted, shamed, castigated. You know, you couldn't get elected dog catcher. A hundred years ago, if you had that same press conference or that same rally, people would say, howdy, neighbor, because, you know, they were neighbors. They were regular folks. And one of the shocking things is that this group tolerance, that the newspaper was called tolerance, they tried to unmask the Klan by printing, you know, they were called the Invisible Empire. They thought, well, if we can print the names of all the members, this will shame them because, you know, they, they did keep their membership secret. So they got these lists from inside and this newspaper published the names. But what happened? Instead of being of shaming them, it was validating. People looked at it and said, oh, well, I know that man. That's my neighbor. Or I know him. He's my banker. Or I know him. He's my minister. 
So Klan membership swelled instead of shrank after they published these lists. Now, to, the, the good part is today, the name of the Ku Klux Klan is toxic, toxic. And you can do it, like I said, you couldn't get elected dog catching. However, the sentiments that they stirred, which is fear and hatred of others, fear of what they called then the replacement theory, what we call now the replacement theory. Those people marching in that Tiki Torch march a couple of years ago said Jews will not replace us. I don't know how many times I found newspaper accounts of speeches where Klansmen or Klanswomen in the 1920s gave a speech where they said, if we don't watch it, if we don't stop this, the Jews will eventually replace us white Christians. So yes, the name is toxic. And yes, we're a much more tolerant, racially diverse, you know, it was a felony in many states to marry a member of the other race. But sadly, that sentiment, I like to think it's greatly diminished, courses through society in things like the Oath Keepers. One of the things that I noticed in the trials here, you have women, people of color, it's a mixed race jury. You point out in your book, 12 white men were faced with this trial. How in the world did D.C. Stevenson ever get convicted? It's a great question. Um, let me give you a little background. The trial happened in Noblesville, Indiana, a wonderful town, spent a lot of time in it, absolutely charming, picture perfect, kind of small town America, about 45 minutes north of Indianapolis. And the courthouse is still intact and there's a plaque outside saying this was the site of the D.C. Stevenson trial. Well, in 1998, I think it was, somebody opened a trunk in a barn just outside of Noblesville. And you know what they found? A Klan membership list, Klan robes, Klan rules, Klan sworn oaths that showed probably 40 percent of the people living in that county were members of the Ku Klux Klan. So the question becomes, how could a town so thick with Klansmen, the newspaper, the Noblesville Ledger, which was a daily, most small towns had daily papers, ran a regular front page feature called Klan Comet, Comet spelled with a K. And in Klan Comet, they would usually talk about the virtues of white supremacy, talk about the virtues of the Klan. Uh, and say this trial is a sham and a witch hunt and a hoax. So the odds were really stacked that Stevenson could ever be convicted in a, in a little town, picture perfect little town that was so heavy with the Klan. To answer your question, Brian, the way they did it was kind of brilliant. It was a great prosecutor named Will Remy, the only elected official of any standing in Indianapolis in 1924 who was not a member of the Klan or under D.C. Stevenson's control. He wrote in his diary, you know, he, they cut his funds off to the prosecutor's office. They tried to kill him once or twice. They threatened his wife. Um, he had to reach into his own pocket to pay for prosecuting this guy. He made the decision. He wanted to crush the Klan. He was a World War I vet. He was a great Hoosier, a great American. But he thought, if I make this trial about the Klan, in a Klan heavy place like Noblesville, I'll probably not succeed. So he personalized it. He made it about woman's, women's virtue. And he said, imagine your daughter or your wife savagely, sexually attacked and chewed on by this monster, D.C. Stevenson. So he avoided the Klan altogether. He never called him the Grand Dragon. He never referenced it. There were people in the courtroom on Stevenson's side who Op said open racial epithets using the n-word to describe some of the witnesses but the prosecutor never ever crossed that clan barrier even though that was his main desire and after this trial was over he proceeded in a series of corruption trials where he basically cleaned up indiana so the brilliance to answer your question was to personalize it imagine your daughter having been the victim well the picture of will remy in your book uh, doesn't exactly I don't want to be critical of what he looked like. doesn't exactly look like a tough guy. You can explain it better than I can. Will Remy, the prosecutor, was known as the boy prosecutor. Though he was a veteran of the Great War, he looked to be a boy of 17. He was a small stature, he had a weak voice. And Stevenson had the best lawyer in the state, this stately, eagle-haired guy named Ephraim Ephraim, and six other lawyers. Stevenson's team was seven lawyers. 
So Will Remy was the most unlikely guy. And I'll tell you a funny, not funny, but an interesting side note. A few days ago, I was reading for my book in uh, St. Louis, had a nice crowd. And afterward, in the signing line, a gentleman came up to me. His face looked vaguely familiar. He was probably in his late 60s, early 70s. And he said, I want to shake your hand. I said, why? He goes, I'm Will Remy's grandson. And, I, you know, it's one of those chills where you, you meet a living presence from history. And he said, all my life, we heard that grandpa was a hero. And all my life, we heard that he was nearly murdered by the Klan. But I didn't know the extent. Now, he hadn't read the book yet, but he said, you know what they called him? I said, yeah, I, I do, but you go ahead and tell me. He goes, they called him the boy prosecutor. <laughs> and I, I said, no, no kidding. <laughs> so how, it was really it was really interesting. Yeah. How did you get your hands on his unpublished memoir, Will Remy's unpublished memoir? Yeah, it's too bad it's unpublished because it's it gets you into his mind. When you write nonfiction, um, you want as much interior information, that is what goes on inside the, the character's heads. And usually you get diaries. But there's, that unpublished manuscript is on file at the Indiana Historical Society. So I spent many days during the pandemic um, just going through the voluminous stuff. And that's one thing I want to emphasize. This story is not unknown. It's there. It's there for anyone who wants to look for it. Uh, there were a couple of academic books written about Stevenson 30 years ago. And you and, and histories of the state in the mid uh, excuse me, in the in the 1940s, all stress, all say the same thing, that the Klan utterly took over the state. But now I would wager, based on what I've heard, most people in Indiana have very little, if if any at all, knowledge of how they were the epicenter of the Klan, and very little, if any, knowledge of D.C. Stevenson. Now, at the time of the trial, which is 1925, the Scopes Monkey trial had just happened earlier. But this trial was considered, at least in Indiana, the trial of the century. And reporters from all over the country covered it. Stevenson was a household word. But now, it's largely disappeared, and they don't teach it. Well, if it'll help you, as I was growing up in Indiana, I don't remember ever being told about the Klan, except my father would say they were anti-Catholic, because we were a mm -hmm. Catholic family. Right. But the other thing was, it wasn't until 1991 when the book was published, I think it's Lutz Holtz book. Uh, yeah, Lutz Holtz. Lutz Holtz, uh, yeah. Uh, we have Lutz published Holtz. by the Purdue University Press. I read right. that book and said, Where, why haven't I been taught this in school? How often did right. you find that attitude when you were walking around the streets of Indiana? Oh, all over. <clears throat> I mean, again, there are people who, scholars, but your average intelligent Hoosier and well-read Hoosier doesn't know this. Now, it goes to some, I think, Brian, it goes to one of the larger and most important arguments we're having in the country right now. How do we teach our history and how do we teach the shameful parts of our history? Um, I worked with Ken Burns on a documentary about my book on the Dust Bowl. And Ken's been um, going around the country recently talking about it's okay to teach the shameful parts of our history because, and he makes a really good point, sometimes the shameful parts are, are intertwined with the glorious parts. And I think that's the case here. This is a very shameful episode of our history um, because we're none of this is based on our constitutional aspirations or how we think of each other as a people. It's cancerous. And in fact, when the Chicago Tribune wrote up this whole episode in the 1930s, they wrote it like it was a bad fairy tale. They said, and so it came to pass that one state was utterly taken over and on and on and on and, and that your fellow American was hated and that Preachers from the pulpit would preach hate. It's also interesting, as you said, that they hated Catholics so much. I'm Catholic as well, grew up Catholic. So, you know, what happened in Notre Dame. But to get to the point I was trying to make, I think it's okay to teach this history. I, I don't think, I think we're stronger if we know these stories. Also, they won. I mean, the good guys won. And they put this guy away. They put this monster, this grand dragon away. He did 30 years in jail. What was the results of the Immigration Act of 1924? So the Klan had three major goals, and they accomplished all of it, okay? The first thing was prohibition. And I didn't know the degree to which the Klan was born out of the temperance movement. The Anti-Saloon League, the most powerful lobby in the early 20th century America, 
really powerful. That's how they got prohibition through. Was the, as, as Clarence Darrow said, was the father and mother of the 1920s Ku Klux Klan. They were one and the same in terms of their goal. So um, their first goal was outlawing alcohol in basically every square foot of the United States. And in Indiana, they went even further. Sauerkraut, in some places, because it's fermented and has a little bit of alcohol, was prohibited in some towns. They made it a crime to possess an empty bottle if it had a little whiff of liquor still in it. They outlawed certain hair tonics because some of them had alcohol in it. So that was their first goal. And they accomplished it, although we all know prohibition was a huge failure because people drank more, actually. <laughs> Number two, the Immigration Act. And this was key. You asked me about that. They passed this act called the National Origins Act of 1924. And basically, it was a blueprint for a bloodstream. They said, we'll turn the clock back to 1890. That was the year they established national origins. And they wanted to have an America that looked like 1890. What did that mean? Most of the Jews hadn't come into this country yet. Most of the Southern Europeans hadn't come into this country yet. Most Greeks hadn't come into this country. Many Asians hadn't come into this country. So it made it almost impossible if you were a Jew to come to this country. Now, some horrible consequences of that to your question. Uh, scholars have estimated that up to 2 million Jews who were killed by Hitler in the Holocaust might have lived had we not passed the National Origins Act. They might have come to this country. Among them, and this is well documented, was the family of Anne Frank. They tried to come to this country, but that Immigration Act of 1924 prohibited them. Um, that law was on the books for 50 years. And it, it made it almost, it, it, again, immigration from Sicily, which they had a horrible earthquake and it was very poor, it went from 800,000 over 20 years to almost nothing. Greek immigration, almost nothing. Asians, outlawed. Africans, outlawed. So that was their centerpiece of what they accomplished during the Klan era. Now, one more thing of the three goals. Moving Jim Crow to the north. So remember, Jim Crow basically disenfranchised all African Americans. They're 36% of the population in the South, but only 1% of them were able to vote in states like Mississippi. But during the Great Migration, Jim Crow moved with Blacks. So places like Indiana, places like Minnesota, Ohio, places, even Seattle, Washington, had redlining laws, had Jim Crow laws that made it that segregated neighborhoods and segregated schools. So that was their other goal, big goal, was to have the kind of Jim Crow sanctions against Blacks that had existed in the South move to the North. So Indiana's schools were segregated until the 1970s. You said something earlier, and I wanted to ask you, because when I was growing up, they, they used to say that one of the counties north of where I lived uh, wouldn't allow black people to let the sun set on them in that county. And you say in your book that all but the 92 counties, 90 of them had that kind of a rule. Do you happen to remember the two counties that didn't have that rule? Boy, I, <laughs> I have the source notes somewhere on that. Somebody did a study of, yeah. those were called sun sundown laws. And, you know, I first encountered them when I did my book on the Dust Bowl in Texas and Oklahoma. And I found, you know, there were pictures of them. There, there's little signs at the edge of town. They basically said, I'll, I'll give you the verbatim, black man, don't let the sun go down on you here. That's why they call them sundown laws. And they, if you were unfortunate enough to be stuck in that town and be black, they would throw you in jail for vagrancy. And you could do maybe 30 days for vagrancy. Well, as you said, <laughs> most counties in Indiana had those laws as well. What uh, what was the hate all about? For instance, there were very few Jews in Indiana in 1925. Why was there such hate for them? A brilliant question, hard to answer. I'll give it my best try. And this is just my theory, of course. So I, I mentioned that I started this book in Oregon. They also had very few Jews and very few African-Americans and not that many Catholics. Indiana was thought by some to be the most homogenous state in the United States with the highest percentage of white Protestant. You 
Protestant is a key word because they were against Catholic. White Protestants were, I think, if I get the figure right, 92% of the state. So, well, you know, very few Jews in you know, there. I, I profile a rabbi who stood up to these guys. I, you know, there was an African American strip called Indiana Avenue where there were lots of clubs and a very prosperous region of you know, African American merchants, doctors. Um, Catholics, I think, were a small percentage. So, what, so the question is why? Why is Oregon, Indiana, these places with very few of these people? As near as I can answer, it was they're coming. You've got a, you know, they're, 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 you're just outside the gates, that America is changing, that blacks are moving north, that Jews are moving from their East Coast strongholds. Uh, I remember a quote from the Imperial Wizard, that is the main guy, leader of all the clan, his name is Hiram Wesley Evans, who was on the cover of Time magazine in 1924, not because they were profiling was a bad guy, but because he was so influential at the 1924 political conventions of both the Democrats and the Republicans that he said the Klan was basically the, the chief lobby at both conventions. Evans goes to Denver, Colorado, gives a speech in 1924, a huge crowd initiates, you know, 3,000 new people into the Klan. And he said, the East Coast now is almost lost to us, meaning lost to the Klan. He said, the Jews have taken over, Blacks and Irish have moved in, Italians are everywhere. And indeed, it was the surge, the peak of all those. He goes, the hope for America is here in places like Denver. So it's a long-winded way of answering your question that they were very homogenous and their fear was that the, you know, they used the word mongrelization. It's a hard word. It could, we apply, we think of it applied to animals. Mongrelization meant that Jews and Protestants would have children together, that blacks and whites would have children together, that, you know, Southern Italians and whites would have children together, all of which has happened in this country in a great amount. But that's what they were afraid of. Go back to D.C. Stevenson the Grand Dragon, the head guy, after he split off with Mr. Evans. Um, yeah. How did he live? What was what was life like for him in uh, Irvington or Indianapolis? DC Steven yeah, D.C. Stevenson never really made a dime for much of his life. As I said, he was a, he's a traveling salesman who bounced around from town to town. But when he lands in Evansville, he announces he's going to run for Congress. Now, Congress paid, I think, $6,000 a year. But at the same time, Stevenson got a job as a Klan recruiter in Evansville. And he realized there was far more money to be made off of the Ku Klux Klan than he could ever make in Congress, let alone selling, you know, linotype machines, you know, town to town, which is one of the things he was selling. They charged 10 bucks to join the Klan. That was... Brian, equal to more than a day's wages. So what would that be today? That'd probably about $300 or $200 for a, a day's wages and change. And Stevenson got a healthy cut of that and the clan rope. So he quickly becomes a millionaire. I calculated it. In today's dollars, after four years in Indiana, he was worth $28 million. So he had a huge mansion, white columned mansion in Irvington, a lovely suburb named for Washington Irving just outside of, just six miles from the downtown Indianapolis. Lovely, old trees, beautiful homes, a great, great, you know, with a history of tolerance because Butler, the college was there. And they had a history of tolerance. But he builds, or he takes over this huge mansion. He calls it, um, oh gosh, what was the term? Something like, there's the, there's the, the clan palace of the north. That's what he called it. The, the clan imperial, because they had it in actual imperial palace in Atlanta, which ironically, when it went bankrupt, the Catholic Church bought it. But the, the Klan Imperial Palace of the North was his home. He had a 98-foot yacht on which he staged these wild, debauched parties. And among the people in those, the membership of those parties were United States senators, governors, judges. He had his own Klan airplane. And I have a whole chapter on the 4th of the July in Kokomo, Indiana, where he descends from the sky and drops down to meet 
up to 200,000 people, the largest rally in the entire history of the Ku Klux Klan in the cornfields outside of Kokomo, Indiana. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a nice town. Pretty much looks the same now as it did then. Um, and he gets out of his airplane. So he got a lot of money. He, he became a multimillionaire because of the Ku Klux Klan. And his parties were utterly debauched. Uh, naked women would pop out of cakes. Uh, you had the best booze you could get. And the cops were there to make sure no one was ever going to break it up. He assigned in, women prostitutes to individual men. Uh, you know, he had these just one of his chief aides who I used quite a bit for my insider stuff. A guy named Court Asher said um, these parties would have shamed Nero. Why did he want to buy the University of Valparaiso? <laughs> That's one of the craziest anecdotes in this story. It blew me away. So <laughs> at the height of his power, he wanted the Klan to have its own college. And poor old Valparaiso was on its, I don't want to say its last legs, but they were in very bad shape after a lot of people left to serve during the World War. They never came back. Um, you know, they were, they were basically broke. And so he offered to buy Valparaiso for $300,000 in dollars then. And his idea was that it would be a Klan exclusive university that would turn out idealized Americans. Now, they said, of course, no Jews would be allowed, no blacks would be allowed, no Catholics would be allowed. But he wanted it to be a counterpoint to his big enemy, 90 miles away, which was the University of Notre Dame. So just as Notre Dame was the citadel of Roman Catholicism for young Catholic men in the United States, his Valparaiso would be the Klan University. And he would turn out these idealized Americans, so-called idealized Americans. That was a big Klan county there. There's tons of sentiment for it. Um, but he had a dispute with the imperial wizard, the head guy, Hiram Wesley Evans, over if their, their, their disputes were always over the spoils of this vast clan, the money, the power. They were both fabulously rich because of this. And the, where Evans didn't want to allow Stevenson to buy Valparaiso because he thought it would give him too much extra power. So he vetoed it at the last minute. And that's one of the things, if not the thing, that led to their ultimate break. One more thing on that. There was a great crusading editor named George Dale from Muncie, Indiana. He was thrown in jail by a Klan judge because Dale had dared to criticize him. Now, the First Amendment gives every American the right to criticize a public official, not in Muncie, Indiana in 1923. He was thrown in the penal farm without a trial by a Klan judge. But Dale considered crusade, continued crusading against the Klan. He's one of the heroes of this book. And he had, he is, is, the way he did this was mocking them. And when they were going to buy this university, he said, oh, what are the classes going to be in tar and feathering? Uh, you know, how to, you know, burn a town, how to hang, a, how to lynch somebody. You know, he openly mocked them as he did with all those, you know, he called them you know, cowards who go around in their, in their grandma's nightgowns. Um, so that, you know, that, yeah, that university was, was one of the craziest things I found. How many Protestant ministers did you discover were members of the Klan? So I never found an exact number, but Stevenson, I would say it was in the many hundreds. And uh, including among them was the most popular Protestant preacher in Noblesville where the trial took place, the trial of the century that forms the last third of this book. And he gave a sermon um, not long before the trial. And the sermon was titled, Is the Ku Klux Klan a Menace to Society? And what he said is, I would, it's the opposite. The menace are the people who are opposed to the Klan. And he, would say, he said something, to, I'm paraphrasing, I would rather have men parade around in hoods and sheets than have my country in a shroud. What Stevenson did is he would go town to town and bribe a minister, give him 50 bucks, give him 100 bucks. He had a lot of money back then. And it was an easy push because they didn't like Catholics and Jews, and a lot of them didn't like blacks. So then he would bribe the minister to pe preach the word of the Klan along with the word of God. 
So one interesting distinction about his clan versus the other clans, that is the 1960s and the 1860s, his clan was sanctified. They had had the blessing of the church, the ministers who blessed it and gave it an imprimatur, a gloss of spirituality. Politicians, you point out that during this period in the middle 20s, 1920s, that 70 members of Congress were members of the Klan? Well, 70 members were under directly under their sway, meaning that was the block that they could count on. I don't know how many of those 70 had taken the oath. I do know for a fact, it's documented in the book, that f at least four, four United States senators took the Klan oath. So they had 70 plus members of Congress who did their bidding. They had four United States senators. In 1924 alone, they elected three Klan governors, including the Clarence Morley of Colorado. And you know what his, he was, he was sworn Klansman, outright open Klansman. And you know what his motto was? Every man under the Capitol dome, a Klansman. And the first thing he did after being elected governor was try to cleanse um, University of Colorado of all faculty who were Jews and Catholics. So they didn't have any black faculty. So he would have cleansed them as well. So they're very powerful politically. Um, two more things on that. They had an office in Washington, D.C., a mile from the White House, staffed by 60 people, 60 members. That's a significant lobby in the Capitol. On August 8th, 1925, they staged a rally. 50,000, according to the Washington Post, Klansmen marched from the Capitol Dome to the Treasury Building. That gives you an idea of their strength and their openness. I don't, I think you'll figure out how to do this, but we can't uh, leave our listeners without some explanation of the train trip. You don't have to go into great deal because that's yeah. center to what ends up happening at the trial. Yeah, I, I mentioned Madge Oberholzer, who's the woman in my subtitle, the woman who stopped them. How old was she, by the way? She was 28 years old. She was unmarried. She dated several men. She was a woman of her age. She was a flapper. She liked to go out at night. She was uh, very independent. She'd cut her hair in a short bob. She'd once driven a car with her girlfriend across the country before the, even the Lincoln Highway was in effect. You know, it was a very daring thing to do. She didn't feel like she needed a band to tell her what to do. She felt like she controlled the play, but her job was in jeopardy. In 1925 so she had no choice but to go to the manor control the state to save her state job well i will tell you this then i'll let your readers in on this <clears throat> he does attack her sexually attacks her attacks her with his teeth and that leads to the trial and to the revelations that will come from her experience and, and that's all integrated into the train trip from Indianapolis up to Hammond. I yeah, they, they, I'll just clarify that. They, there's a, there's the last train to Chicago. There's the midnight train out of Indianapolis and uh, he kidnaps Madge and takes her to this train berth with his two goons and throws her in this car <coughs> and rapes her and attacks her with his teeth on this train ride to Chicago. And says, says afterward, I am the law. And she, don't even think of going to the police. No one will believe you. How many people in Indiana knew that Governor Ed Jackson was a Klansman? Great question, because some people still try to excuse Jackson. I mentioned this newspaper called Tolerance, which published the list of the, all the Klansmen. In 1923, Jackson was the Secretary of State. He was not yet governor. And lo and behold, they got a membership list that showed Ed Jackson, Secretary of State of the state of Indiana, was a sworn member of the Ku Klux Klan. He didn't dispute it. They had the membership thing there. He ran for governor a year and a half later, or a year later, as an open Klansman. I would say almost everyone who voted in the 1924 election knew exactly. And the Klan cleaned up in the 24 election. They got every office they wanted from the governor all the way down. Even while Stevens is awaiting trial, the Klan mayor in Indianapolis, the Klan's favorite, won his election. And a, a very good newspaper, the Indianapolis Times, which is no longer with us, 
won a Pulitzer Prize for their coverage of the Klan, their corruption, and the, the stranglehold they had on your beloved state. They ran a screaming headline just before the election saying, Hoosiers, come to your senses. We're about to give our state over to the Klan. It, uh, Brian, it was not hidden. It was a very binary choice. It was not even coded. It was just, as the Indianapolis Times said, never a popular newspaper, you're either for the Klan or you're against the Klan. Here's the vote. So to answer your question, I would venture almost every voter, every sentient voter in 1924 knew exactly what they were voting for. 31 years in prison for D.C. Stevenson. Where did they put him? They put him in uh, Michigan City, uh, which is the penitentiary on the lake in the far north. And what happened was he finally got out. He filed a million appeals. None of those appeals ever went anywhere. He said he was a martyr. He compared himself to Jesus. He said, you know, not since Jesus was crucified. Has there been any person who's been so martyred? He said it was a hoax set up by his enemies that, you know, they were out to destroy him and destroy the Klan. No appeals court ever found anything but the verdict of those 12 men in Noblesville. After 31 years, he gets out. And what does he do? He's 71 years old. And he's arrested in the state of Missouri for attempting to sexually molest a 16-year-old girl. What? Incorrigible. What? I mean, keeping in character, I guess you would call it. What, you know? what was the result of his conviction, and when did the Klan, if it did, go away in Indiana? Yeah, so um, there were several major, major investigations right after Stevenson was put away. The United States Senate conducted an investigation where they went around to different parts of the Midwest and held hearings which showed the degree of Klan corruption. But importantly for Indiana, some of the major, these pillars of the community, may, some of them may have been Klansmen, largely newspaper men, got together and put a network of reporters together. And they broke several stories on how significant the Klan's control was and how corrupt they were. So that broke, it, the two things broke the Klan. One was the revelations that showed how depraved they were. You know, no, you know, God-fearing Hoosier wanted to belong after they were identified with this rapist, this sadist, this cannibal, this murderer. Number two was all the pillars of the community in the newspaper world exposed them, led by the Indianapolis Times, which got their Pulitzer for that. There was also a trial of Ed Jackson. He beat the rap because of the statute of limitations, but the trial showed how deep he was in the Klan pocket. There was a trial of the Klan majority city council in the city of Indianapolis, uh, and most of those people went to jail. So they were criminals, and they put these criminals in jail. So I immediately, as I'm reading your book, I immediately went to Google and typed in the Ku Klux Klan Lafayette, Indiana. I wanted to see what I could yeah. find. And only one thing came up, which I know that I don't want to get my hopes up here, but only one thing right. came up. And that was a photograph in a cemetery of 25 Klansmen dressed in their white robes and the hoods. That's all it was. Hmm. I want to know, though, from you about why the garb, why the hoods and the, all this. What was the point of all that? Yeah, it's a good question. And... Um... It's because the original Ku Klux Klan, formed by six ex-Confederates in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1866, had this idea that they would be ghosts. They were called the Invisible Empire. They, they, the image was that they were the ghosts of these dead Confederate soldiers who've come back from the grave in spiritual form, in spectral form, to wreak havoc on these Reconstructionists these carpetbaggers who were in the South telling them how to live. So they were born during the raids of the 1860s. They would go around and they have their little skeletal hands would sometimes be sticking out of the robes to scare people. And maybe, you know, people talked about, I, th I saw him, I thought it was a ghost. So that was the first thing. The hoods were to make them look taller. They were on horseback usually when they raided. 
and the hood made them look 16 inches taller. The robes were to make them look like ghosts. And, you know, when kids dress up as ghosts on Halloween to be Casper, what do they do? They put a sheet over themselves. That's what it was all about. It was a white sheet so they would look like ghosts. Let you go in a second or so. Uh, but I want to know when you went back to Indiana, around the Noblesville area, Irvington and in, in Indianapolis and places like that, did you run into anybody uh, besides Will Remy, who you found his grandson in St. Louis or whatever, did you run in anybody in Indiana that had uh, knew the history of this based on a family connection? Yeah, um, I did actually. I did actually. And several people told me about their grandparents belonging. And they said it was a shameful thing. They knew about it. They, they weren't supposed to talk about it. Um, they knew of a cross burning or they knew of a rally. It was family lore. And so, you know, when they opened that trunk, out sprang not just these documents and secrets, but the kind of stories that had been suppressed. Just recently, I ran into some members of the Oberholzer family, which blew me away because that's Madge Oberholzer, the heroine at the center of my story. And um, they said that what happened to her basically destroyed the family, that they they never really recovered after this. So, yeah, I... Um, one of the great positive stories, which I heard personally from a man who'd done a lot of digging into this, an Indian man, and I forget his name, was how jazz still flourished, not only flourished, but advanced during this dark era of intolerance. So on the same day, Brian, the same day that Richmond, Indiana, which is on the Ohio border, staged the largest Klan rally in its history, 40,000 hooded and robed flame burning men, Louis Armstrong and King Oliver's Quartet cut the first African-American jazz album in a studio in a shed a few blocks away from where the Klan rally has happened. And I heard that story from lovers of jazz in Indiana. Uh, I shouldn't do this but on a personal note. My first ever interview with somebody of national character was in Richmond, Indiana. It was when I was in yeah. high school and his name most people listening won't know this name, Tex Beneke, who led the uh, Glenn Miller Orchestra after Glenn Miller died. And so when I was reading this, I thought, and it, didn't Hoagie Carmichael also, did he also Hoagie, record in, in uh, Richmond? Hoagie Carmichael cut his first major hit, um, Stardust, uh, yeah. help me out here. Why, yeah. why, and this will be the last question, why yeah. that studio in Richmond, Indiana? So it was a former piano uh, factory where they, you know, before television and radio, pianos were the main source of entertainment. This place would turn out a piano every two days. It was a giant factory run by two Italian immigrants, the Jeanette factory, and down by the river, down there, they used the waterfall for power. And since they were making pianos, they also had a little kiln dried shed that they converted to a recording studio. <laughs> and it was the only recording studio between New York and Los Angeles where you could do quality, you know, they had a wax cylinder recording, you needed that machine. And so if you wanted to cut a record and you lived in the Midwest, which is to say Chicago, which is where Louis Armstrong was at the time, or Hoagie Carmichael, who cut a record in that same place where Louis did a year later, you had to go to Richmond, Indiana. So it was, um, as they proudly and mostly accurately say, Richmond, Indiana is the birthplace of modern jazz. <laughs> And it happened during the Ku Klux Klan era. This book is titled A Fever in the Heartland. And our guest has been longtime author, 10 books, Timothy Egan, based in Seattle, Washington. We thank you very much for your time. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Brian. And uh, since we first spoke 30 years ago, I hope we speak in 30 years from now. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Thanks, right. Tim, very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great interview. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments? We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.